Hello and welcome to Working with Data in Excel. My name is Nari Mason and I am a trainer with the Digital Literacy Team at the Australian National University. If you haven't already received the exercise file I will be working with today, you can download it from this website. Just click on the Excel tab, click on the following file, Excel Exercises, and save it to your computer. Once the file has downloaded, just double click on it to open it in Excel. The PDF handout for this class can be found at this web address below. Okay, we will start with the blank spreadsheet. And I will show you the recommended spreadsheet setup to make full use of all the features of Excel. Um, Heading row only in the first row of your spreadsheet because um, if you set it up that way, you can use um, pivot tables more easily, filter more easily, and also sort more easily. Um, only have your data um, underneath that. Um, if you need to have any annotations, I found the best way to do that is to create text boxes like this. To put your annotations in because if you put your annotations in the cells of the spreadsheet and then you sort the data um, you can sort your annotations along with the data at the same time so it's just easier to do that and it's quite easy to put um, a text box in here itself you just go to the insert menu and there is a text box function just here when you click on that you can click and drag to create a text box and type in whatever you like into that. Okay, um, when you're entering data and you have blanks, well, you have no data to enter, so you're typing in one, two, the next data point is missing, so you skip it. Do not be tempted to fill in blank cells with a zero. Okay, and the reason for that is zero is a number that will be used in calculations. It will also be used when you're um, performing count functions. So when you're trying to count how many cells there are, um, valid cells there are in a column, it will count the zeros as well. Um, just a note that if you're in the habit of using the space bar to clear a cell, um, that actually puts a space character into the cell, which also gets counted in count functions. So if you ever need to delete data in a cell, it's better to hit the delete key or the backspace key on your keyboard. Um, one great thing about um, Excel is that it has a handy um, fill function. So often when you are dealing with spreadsheets, you need to have an ID column so you can keep track of whose data belongs to whom. So it's basic common practice to create an ID, an ID header. Um, IDs have to be unique numbers and commonly we'll just type in one, enter, two, enter, three, enter and so on. Um, now when you're entering data um, you might also be tempted to use the arrow keys to go one cell down and one cell higher. Um, try and get into the habit of using the enter key to move a cell down and the tab key to move the cell across because once you're in that habit it becomes a lot um, more efficient to type in formulas and not make mistakes because if you use the arrow keys to move down a cell to close the formula um, you actually start including the cell below in your formula and it becomes really annoying. Okay, so when you want to type in consecutive numbers like this, um, it gets very, very tedious. So Excel has created this lovely function called filling down. Now hopefully you can see in this cell, there's a little green box in the bottom left hand corner when you hover your mouse over it the icon of your mouse turns into a black plus okay if you now click when it's a black plus and drag down to say row 30 and let go by default it copies that cell and it pastes it to all the cells below 
um, up until where you let go. Now I actually want to fill a series rather than just copy the first cell. So while it's still selected and active, you can click on this icon where it says auto fill options and choose fill series instead. And then it fills the numbers down from one to 29. Um, sometimes that gets a little bit tedious for me. I don't know about you. So I actually like to type in the first three numbers for Excel to show it the pattern that I really want. Then click and drag to select those three cells. Hang on to the little green box in the bottom right hand corner and drag down and let go. Excel is then smart enough to know that that's exactly what you want them to do. If you want um, a pattern of numbers rather than one, two, three, four, you can also start the pattern for Excel and it will continue it for you. So if I just want even numbers, two, four, and six, I'll click and drag to highlight those cells, then wait until I get the black plus symbol in the corner and drag down and let go. It goes and fills it down and only even numbers. Okay, um, there's another function called flash fill. So if I wanted to um, do this more quickly, um, I don't have to click and drag down, especially if you have a really long spreadsheet. You can just click and drag to select the numbers um, of the pattern that you wanted to start. Instead of clicking and dragging down, you just double click on that green box and it fills down to wherever the data stops on the left hand side of it. So if I did have any blank cells in this column, it would stop there. But you can just click on the green box and drag it down further if you need to. Now we will move to the moving and selecting spreadsheet by clicking on the moving and selecting tab at the bottom left of the screen. Here I'll show you how to navigate around a spreadsheet. Now it's particularly useful to use shortcuts to navigate around a really large spreadsheet rather than just scrolling down, scrolling up and using the scroll bar on the right hand side to scroll across. So the first thing I'm going to show you is how to go to the first cell of your data set. All you have to do is hold down the control key and then home. If you're on a Mac, whenever I say control key, I mean command key. When you want to go to the last cell in the data set, you hold down the control key and then end. If you want to go to the beginning of the row that you're in, you just have to hold down the home key. Just press the home key. If you want to return to the top of a particular column that you are in, you can also hold down control and then use the up arrow and it gets you to the top of the column. Control and right arrow will get you to the end of the column. If there is a blank cell in the region, such as in row 10, when I use control right arrow, it stops when it finds a blank cell. All you have to do is hold down control again, arrow, arrow, until you get to where you want to be. If you want to select cells within a spreadsheet, you're probably familiar with being able to use your mouse to click and drag to make a selection. You can also use the shift key. So if I hold down the shift key and then the right arrow, I start selecting cells to the right of the cell I began at. If I keep holding down the control key and then hit the down arrow, I will select further cells down the rows. If you need to select cells that are not right next to each other, as I've done here to create these highlights, you use the control key for that as well. So for example, I'm gonna select these highlighted cells again. I'll put my cursor in the first cell, then hold down the control key, click on the next cell, keep holding control, click on the next cell, keep holding control, and click on the next cell again. So you can 
select non-contiguous cells or cells that are not next to each other. If you want to select an entire row and go beyond the data itself, then you can just click on the row number when you get that black arrow. And of course you can select multiple rows by just clicking and dragging down from the row numbers. You can also do that with the column letters, but there are also handy shortcuts for doing that too. So if I hold down the control key and hit spacebar, I select an entire column. If I hold down shift and then the spacebar, I select an entire row, but you'll notice that it goes beyond the data itself. If you wanted to just select this row to where the data stops, you can use a combination of the control and shift keys and then use the right arrow key and it will stop and select all of those cells until it gets to the end of the row. If you would like to select the entire data in your spreadsheet in one go, the handy shortcut there is the control and then A key. So if you hold down control and then press A, it selects the entire spreadsheet of data and the data only. Sometimes when you're working with long data sheets, um, you would like the heading row to stay in place. So we do that using something called freezing panes. Freezing panes can also be used to fix and freeze columns as well. And I will show you how to do that too. Okay, so the first thing you do is you go into the view menu at the top of the screen and you will see a freeze pane icon. When you click on that, you have an automated option to freeze the top row only, which is what most people use. So if I click that, you might notice that a line appears at the bottom of row one. And also when you start scrolling down from now on, the header stays where it is. If you just wanted to freeze the first column of a spreadsheet, there's an, also an automated function in freeze panes where you can freeze the first column. I'm gonna unfreeze panes now and show you something a little bit more complex. Say for example, this spreadsheet becomes very, very large. I not only want to freeze the first row, but I also want to freeze these first four columns. I need to find a cell that's at the conjunction of those points, and that will be cell E2. So it's below row one, and it's to the right of column D. Now when I go to the freeze panes menu, I'll select freeze panes, just the top option. And now I get a line below row one, and I do get a sort of a gray line to the edge of column D. When I scroll down now, the header column stays. When I scroll across using the scroll bar in the bottom right hand corner, those first four columns stay in place as well. If you want to unfreeze the panes again, you just click on freeze panes in the view menu and then unfreeze panes and it becomes the same as it was before. So that's another reason why it's important to reserve your first row for your headers so you can make full use of that automated feature. Next, we'll go on to the Formula One tab at the bottom here, and I will show you how to do some basic calculations. When typing in a formula in Excel, Excel has to identify it as a formula rather than text. So I can't just type in one plus one and hit the enter or return key because it thinks it's text. All formulas have to start with an equal sign, not a space and then an equal sign because it will see that as text as well. So all formulas start with an equal sign. You can use any number of these symbols in your formulas. So the plus, minus, forward slash, it does not, recommend, um, rec does not recognize backslash. Um, the asterisk is for multiplication. 
the percentage symbol um, is used in conjunction with multiplication in order to calculate percentages. So cell A1% percent of multiplication, B1. And the hat symbol is used to raise a number to a power. So cell A1 raised to the power of 2 is A1 squared. It's important to remember the order of operations. So the first thing that happens in calculations is whatever is in parentheses or brackets happens first. So for example, in this formula on the right here, 1 plus 2 will be calculated first, and then the result of that will be multiplied by 3. And then 4, and then 5 will be added to the result. Negation happens second in the order of operations because you might have negative numbers. Percentages are calculated next, then exponentiation, so raising numbers to a power, then multiplication, division, and addition. There are further examples of how this order of operations will change the result of a formula in this box to the right. So, when typing in a formula, here we want to calculate the total amount for each of these four months. So we start with an equal sign. Instead of just typing in 22 plus 33, it's more efficient to use the cell reference numbers. Okay, and what I mean by that is the number that comes up when you click on a cell, it is row letter, uh, sorry, column letter and row number. When typing in a formula, you could start the formula with an equal sign and then type in the numbers that you want to add together, so 22 plus 33, etc. But it is much more efficient to use the cell reference numbers instead of the numbers themselves. So in this case, we want to use the cell reference number B2. So I'll type in B2. You'll notice that B2 now becomes blue and so does the cell it refers to. So that's a handy way to make sure that you have entered the correct cell into your formula. The reason why we do this is sometimes we find there are data entry errors, in which case you don't have to redo the entire formula that you've written here. You can just change the cell itself and it will already update the formula. So the next cell in this formula is going to be 33. So I'll type in plus, then B3, and you can see that's been color coded as red. Then plus again. I could type in B4 next, but it is generally easier for me, I find, to click on the cell I want to include in the formula, and it will type the cell reference number in for me. So I just clicked on cell B4, it typed B4 in the formula, and now I can continue. So plus, I'll use my mouse to click on cell B5, and that adds it to the formula too. Now I've finished, um, I will not use the down arrow to move, to close off my formula, because as you see, it starts including a different cell in the formula if I do that. That's why it's always good practice to get into the hang of using the enter or tab keys to move from cell to cell. So I'll click enter now, and there is my total. I'll show you how to use the percentage calculation feature. So here I want to calculate 7% of 22. I do that by typing in the equal sign first, then 7% times, so the asterisk, 7% of, I could type 22, but I'm going to click on the cell B2, so it refers to that cell for me. 7% of B2, click enter, and there's 7% of B2. If you ever want to copy the result of a formula to another cell for use later, you can't just copy and paste directly because what you will be copying and pasting is the formula and not the value. 
So if you want to paste the value to another cell, just right click on the cell and choose copy. Right click on the cell where you want to copy. Go to paste special. And then paste values. So you see here in this cell, you only have the value and not the formula. The next thing I'll show you is on the formula two tab and the bottom here. Here are some other ways that you can perform calculations without having to use lots of pluses and minuses, etc. So in this example, they have just added up the cells as we did on the previous spreadsheet. But you can also use something called a sum function. And there are several different functions in Excel and sum is probably the most commonly used. The sum function will tell Excel to sum up whatever is in these parentheses or brackets. So if I type in equals and then sum to begin with, you'll notice that you have some options in a drop down menu at the bottom because there are lots of different sum functions that you can use, but the basic one is sum. So you can either just click on sum and select it or you continue the formula in the cell. Some functions have to have brackets after them, so you start with an open bracket. Now you'll notice in the example here it says C13 colon C18. The colon means that Excel must take all cells from C13 all the way up to C18 and sum them together. So here I actually want to sum from D13 colon and I don't want D13 again, I want that one there, D18 then close bracket. You can see the selection of all the cells that it is going to sum together in blue. So now when I hit enter, I get the result that I want. There's an easier way to do that. You can type in the equals symbol again, sum again, open bracket, but instead of typing in C13, you can just use your mouse to click and drag the range of cells that you want included in the sum function. Then close bracket and enter, and that does the same thing. In the next example, this is how you would add up individual cells that are not necessarily attached to each other or right next to each other, so non-contiguous cells. Non-contiguous cells are indicated by commas instead of colons. Uh, a better example would be in this um, cell here. So here we've taken the sum of C46 to C47, the blue numbers. Then there's a comma, C49, comma, C51. So it summed these contiguous cells together using a colon, then comma separated to add this cell and then that cell. So. If you type in equals, sum, and it is not case sensitive, so don't panic that this is in lowercase. Open bracket, I'm gonna use my mouse to click and drag to tell Excel that I want these two cells together included in the sum. And you'll see that it's put the colon in for me. Then I could type in the comma now if I wanted to, but you can also use that handy trick of selecting non-contiguous cells that I showed you on the moving and selecting spreadsheet. So I will now hold down the control key, use my mouse to click on cell D49. So you can see it's skipped the cell in between. Hold down control still and click on cell D51. It's put the comma in again. Now all I have to do is close the brackets and hit enter and that's the result of my calculation. There is also a handy auto sum function so you don't have to type in anything, um, you just have to click one button in most cases. 
So to do that, we'll go to the formulas tab at the top of the screen. So the formulas menu, and you'll see a great big sigma symbol with auto sum written underneath. There is a drop down menu there, which shows you that you can auto sum, auto average, auto count numbers, auto find the maximum value in a range and the minimum value in a range. Here we're going to use auto sum and all you have to do is click on the big sigma symbol. And here you see it's typed in everything for you and it's smart enough to know that you wanted that range of data. If you have any blank cells, again, it's probably going to stop wherever there's a blank cell. So if you want to increase that range, you can hang on to one of these little blue boxes at the edge of the selection. Your arrow turns into a double arrow. Then click and drag higher up and let go where you want it to finish. I actually want that smaller range that it's selected automatically, so I'll click and drag back to where it was. And then enter. And all you had to do was two clicks and you have automatically summed your column. If you want to do something that's a little bit more um, functional than just summing things up, um, for example, if you want to calculate the average of a column or the standard deviation of a column, you can find that either in one of these little books at the top of the screen that have their own drop down menus. So if you're dealing with finance data, it limits all the functions you can use to finance in this menu. Maths and trigonometry, it limits all of those into this menu. Probably easiest is to use the insert function icon. By clicking on insert function, you can directly look for the formula you're looking for or the function that you're looking for. So here I would like to find a standard deviation. I'll type in standard deviation and then go. It hasn't actually come up with standard deviation to begin with, but here we can see something that looks generally like a standard deviation function. There are quite a few standard deviation functions and all of them are explained in the little text box below. When you click on one of these, it explains exactly what it means. Generally, when you're dealing with data, you are either going to use STDEV, which estimates the standard deviation based on a sample, or STDEVP, which calculates the standard deviation based on the entire population. So when you have data that represents the entire population that you're hoping to infer to, or to say something about, then you would use the standard deviation for the population because you have the population data at your disposal. If you only have a sample of the population in your data set, then you have to use the standard DEV formula. There are statistical reasons for that. Um, if you'd like to find out more, I'm sure there's plenty of information on the internet. But most of the time for research, you're going to be using standard DEV. So I will click OK. You'll notice that in the cell it starts typing in the formula for you and it also guesses that that is the range that you are interested in. If that is not the range you are interested in, you can just delete what's in that first box in the function arguments window. Then use your mouse within the data file itself to click and drag to select the selection you want the standard deviation for. When that's correct, all you have to do is click OK and there is your function. The next thing I will show you is in the rows and columns spreadsheet. One of the great things about the fill down function that we saw before is that it doesn't only ref help you with filling down a series of numbers. You can also fill down formulas. So here, all I need to do is type in the formula for this row of data and fill that formula down and it will automatically do the same thing for all the rows below it. So you can choose your favorite method of summing up 
these first, second, third and fourth quarter results. But I'm just going to put my cursor in cell G2 and hit the auto sum button. And it does it automatically for me. Now I'll click enter. When I go back to cell G2, I'm going to fill that formula, which you can see in the formula bar at the top. I'm going to fill that down to the other rows. So I will just hang on to that little green box at the edge of the square so that my plus turns into a black plus symbol. Click and drag down and it fills down that formula. So you'll see the first row is cell C2 to F2. The next formula is for C3 to F3. The next one C4 to F4 and the last one C5 to F5. And the reason why that works is because Excel uses something called relative cell referencing. So it knows when you're filling down a formula, you're referring to different rows each time it fills down. The same thing goes with filling across a formula. So if I want to calculate the total for the first quarter and then do the same for the others, I can just click on auto sum. It auto sums the first quarter for me. Click enter. Then I will auto fill from the first quarter to the fourth by clicking and dragging that little green box. And you can see now the first formula refers to row, um, column C, the second column D, the third column E, and the fourth column F. Now, sometimes you don't want relative cell referencing. So for example, I want to calculate the bonus amount in the bonus, or the bonus total um, in all of these rows. I'm going to put the bonus amount in the box over here, which in this case I'll have as 7%. Okay. My formula is going to refer to this box, 7%, rather than me typing in equals 7% of that cell because I might change my mind later on. I might want to give everybody 10% bonus. So in that case, I don't need to redo these formulas. All I need to do is change the value in that box. So I'll just delete what I've got there. My bonus total is going to refer to cell K2 times, because I don't need the percentage symbol anymore. It's already written in cell K2. So K2 times cell G2. Then click enter. But now when I fill down by clicking and dragging, I get no value in these cells. And that's because this formula is now referring to cell K3 and G3. So I wanted the formula to only refer to cell K2 when it fills down, not to use relative cell referencing but fixed cell referencing. The way to do that is to use a dollar sign. So I'll change the formula here in the formula bar so it's a bit easier to see. If you want to fix the column letter then you would put a dollar sign in front of the column letter so that when it fills across it's only referring to that particular row, oh, sorry, that particular column. If you want to fix a row in your formula, you have to put a dollar sign in front of the row. So now when I fill down, it's only going to refer to row two in the K column. If you want to fix it to that one cell and that one cell only, no matter whether or not you fill down or fill across, you're going to need to put a dollar sign in front of both the column letter and the row number. So essentially, whatever you want to stay, you're going to have to pay for it with the dollar sign. In this case, I'm not filling across, so I don't really need to worry about putting a dollar sign in front of the column letter but I'm going to leave it there anyway because it doesn't really make any difference. So dollar sign K 
dollar sign two times G two. Then hit enter. Now I'm going to have to fill down again because it won't update that automatically for me. So I'll click on the little green box. Sorry, I missed the green box. Click on the green box, drag down and let go. And there it's updated the formula so that it only ever refers to cell K2, but the rows are allowed to change. Okay, uh, the next thing I will show you is how to um, sort and filter your data. So I'm now moving to the functions spreadsheet at the bottom. And here we have some data relating to the exam and tutorial particip participation marks for a class at the ANU. If you would like to just see all the courses combined together to make it more easily, so here it's already nicely grouped B A L L V and so on, but some of these are mixed up as well. So if you'd like to sort your data so they're all together. Um, the first thing you need to be aware of is you need to select only the data that you want to sort. So I could do control A, but you can see that it's gone beyond the bounds of my data. It's also included the annotations that I've got. If I leave it like that, the annotations will be sorted along with the rest of my data. Um, please be aware that there seems to be a glitch in Excel at the moment that if I click on this little green box to minimize the selection, it's actually going to delete everything that I no longer selected. So for example, I'll show you. I'll click and drag. When I go to the top, all that annotation data is missing. Luckily, there's a handy undo button at the top. So I'm just going to use my mouse to click and drag that selection myself. So I'm absolutely sure I've got everything that I need. Okay. Then we go into the data menu and click on sort. Now, please be careful in the future, whenever you're sorting data, even just by one column, you just have to select the entire data set that needs to be sorted along with that one column. If you just select, for example, column A to sort by uni ID, only column A will be sorted. All of this will still remain in place. So everything that needs to be sorted along with the columns that you choose needs to be selected. Okay, so in this case, I would like all the course data clump together. So my data has headers and you can see the little white, um, the little blue tick here that says my data has headers. That's another good reason why you should always reserve your first row for headers. Because if I untick this, then it's going to sort by column A, B, C and D. And that will include the headers in my sort. So all the headings will be sorted along with the rest of my data. And we don't want that. So I'll tick my data has headers again. I want to sort by course. So in this drop down menu, I will select the course header. I'm sorting by cell values, which is usually what you're going to do, but there is a drop down menu where you do have some other more funky options. You can sort from A to Z or backwards from Z to A but usually it's A to Z. Now within course, I'd also like to sort all these students by their surname, so they're in alphabetical order. So I'm going to add a level to the sorting. So first it's going to sort by course, and then within course, I want it to sort by the person's surname. Again, by cell values in A to Z. Some people might have the surname in the same course, so I'm going to add a third level to sort by their initials within surname at the end. When you're happy, you just click OK. And now it's all sorted. 
So alphabetically, course B, A, L, L, B comes first. And they're all grouped together. Then they're sorted by surname, Baum to Wong. And then if there are any double ups in surnames like there are here, they are sorted by initial then. Sometimes the reason why you're sorting is just so you can see people in one particular course together more easily. But in that case, what you might rather do is use the filter option. So if you want to filter your data, all you have to do is click on the filter symbol on the data menu, which looks like a funnel. Then every single one of your headers will now have a drop down menu associated with it. And you can filter by one, two, three, or all of these headers if you want to. I'll do, just do something simple to begin with. I'm going to sort, um, to filter, so that I only see the course B, E, C, L, L, B. So I will untick select all, so it all becomes refreshed. B, E, C, L, L, B. I will tick and then click OK. And now I'm only seeing students in that particular course. To give you some kind of a reminder that you are looking at your filtered data and not the entire data set, you'll notice that there's a filter symbol next to the course header. And all the row numbers have now turned blue. Okay, so if you ever see blue row numbers, it means that you've got a filter turned on. To turn off the filter, you just click on the drop down menu next to course again, either tick select all, or you can click on clear filter from course. And then they all come back again. One handy thing about filtering is that it can make it easier to do tasks such as assigning grades just to people who have a mark um, that fits within these grade ranges in the legend here. So I'm going to filter the data by their total score so that I can only see the students who receive a credit grade. So I click on the drop down menu next to total. And for this, I'm going to select number filters. For a credit, they need to have scored between two numbers, 60 and 69. So I'll select between. In the first box, the first number is 60. So it has to be greater than or equal to 60. And in the second box, I'll type in 69. Then click OK. Now I'm only seeing the students who would receive a credit grade. In the grade column, I can now give them a CR. And I don't have to type in CR for all of these cells. Okay, you'll notice that they're not all contiguous rows. There are gaps in between the rows. But if I use the fill down fit feature here to copy and paste CR to all of these cells, it will only paste it to the rows I can see, not to the entire data set. So I'm going to use the flash fill feature by double clicking. And for some reason it hasn't gone all the way down, so I'll just click and drag a bit further down. And now all those students have their CR grade at the end. Just to prove that not all the students in between these rows have received a CR grade, I will take the filter off the total column by clicking on the drop down menu and then selecting clear filter from total. And there you see, not everyone in between has a CR grade. You can also use logical arguments to filter through text. So for example, in the surname column, I might be looking for a particular student. Their surname began with BR and I can't remember who it was. So instead of sorting through the data, I can just filter by surname and look for students whose surnames begin with BR. So I'll click on the drop down menu next to surname and then use a text filter to do that. Now I could use begins with, but I'm gonna show you something a little bit trickier that's a lot more flexible. I'm gonna select equals and then use things called wildcards. Okay. 
so equals. The surname begins with BR, I know that. And I can use these wild cards at the bottom to help me for my search. So a question mark can be used to represent any single character. If I knew that this surname was five letters long, and I just wanted to look at surnames that began with BR with an extra three letters, I could type in question mark, question mark, question mark. Then I only get five letter surnames that begin with BR. But I don't know how long this surname is. So I can use the asterisk to represent any number of characters. So if I type in BR asterisk, then I will get all surnames beginning with BR. If I knew that the surname ended with the letter N, and I just didn't know what was in between, then I could also put an end, an, an N at the end of that logical argument. So all surnames that start with BR and end with an N will be found if I do that. But I'm gonna leave it as BR asterisk, then click OK. And here they all are, Brown and Brunt. Again, to turn off the filter, you just need to go to the drop down menu for surname and clear filter from surname, and everyone is back again. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the filter off. And we'll move on to the display data spreadsheet. So here I'll show you how to create and edit charts. Um, it's quite simple in Excel. Um, the first thing you have to do though is to create a summary table like this. So Excel cannot create a chart easily, anyway, um, from the raw data. So here in the functions tab, I can't just select course and total and get it to summarize the data for me in a chart. I do need to go that extra step further and create a summary table of my data and then use that to create the chart that I want. So I'm gonna start by creating a bar chart from this data here that starts on row 24. So when you have a summary table, it's a good idea to give all of your um, headers in the summary table itself. That way you don't have to do it after the fact in Excel. So I have all the years, as labels here and semester one and two as labels for the rows. Now I use my mouse to click and drag the summary table, go into the insert menu at the top. And if you know exactly what you want, you probably can just go to these drop down menus like with bar charts and pie charts and all those sorts of things and get what you want. But if you're not quite sure, you can always go to the recommended charts icon, which is pretty cool. So I'll click on recommended charts and it is smart enough to know that I do want a clustered bar chart. So I want different colored bars for each semester. I will then click OK. And here is my chart. There are three ways that you can edit a chart. Um, the first way that most people use is just to use the chart tools tab with the design and format tabs underneath it. So when the chart is not active, so if I click somewhere outside of the chart, you do not have the chart tools tab at the top. But when I click back on to the chart itself, I get the chart tools tab and the design and format tabs here. Now, if you don't like the look of this chart, you can have a look at the different chart styles that it can recommend, and you just hover your mouse over each one of these styles, and you pick the one that you like, and just click on it, and it stays. Um, if you want to change the colors, there is some minimal functionality on this particular tab. By clicking on change colors, you can change the color scheme. But these are pre-approved Microsoft color schemes, essentially. So if you're not keen on these either, there is another way to do it where you have more control. If you need to add a chart element, so for example here, 
they haven't got the axis title for the y-axis, so you don't know what these numbers represent. You can go to the add chart element on the top right and choose axis titles. So you can have the primary horizontal, so the x-axis or the primary vertical, the y-axis. There is, however, another way you can add elements to a chart. When you have the chart activated, you'll notice that there are these three icons to the side. The plus is essentially the same as add chart element, but it's a little bit more convenient. So if I click on the plus for chart elements, I can use this to go to access titles, click on the black arrow, and I will choose primary vertical directly. So it's a little bit closer than going all the way over there, but not much. So now that I have my access title, all I have to do is clear the text that's already in there and type in number of enrollments. Then I won't hit enter because it will just give me another row. Backspace. Click anywhere outside that dotted line and it will close off the text editing. If you want to change the number of the title of the chart, you just click on chart title, delete what's there, and type in the title, number of enrollments per semester per year. Then click somewhere outside of that box to close off editing. If you decided that you didn't want the clusters to be by year, but you wanted them to be by semester, you don't have to create a brand new chart. You can go to the design tab under chart tools and select switch row and column. So if I click on that, it changes the cluster to cluster them by semesters rather than by years. If I want it to go back again, I just click on switch row and column. Essentially what that does is it takes this chart, this table that created the chart, and it pretends that you formatted it the other way around, it, that you transposed it. One of the fantastic things about Excel is if you find that you've made an error in your table that created the chart, you don't have to redo the chart all over again. You can just go into the table and let's say this was supposed to be 3200, change the data and it updates the chart automatically. Change it back to 3100, just have a look at this bar here, it changes it back. If you decided that you didn't actually want 2010 reported because you didn't have both semester one and semester two data at the time, then you can just remove that column without having to change the table at all. So when I go into the design tab under chart tools, there is an icon called select data. If you click on select data, it also allows you to unselect data to display. So I want to unselect 2010 because I don't have a complete data set for that then click OK, and now I just have 2007, 8 and 9. If you just change your mind and you want it back again, you just go back to select data and tick the box again because it's always a possibility. You can do the same thing for semester one and semester two. So if you just wanted to see semester one data, you can do that here as well. For now I'll click OK. If you wanted to have a bit more control over what colors um, are represented on your chart, or you want to change the y-axis value, values or increments, um, the much easier way to edit a chart is by using a special chart editing window. Now to get that window, the easiest thing to do is to double click on the chart itself. So anywhere in the chart, just double click, and you'll get a format chart option area on the right hand side. You can always close that to get more real estate later on. You just have to double click on the chart to get it back again. 
Now the options here will change depending on what you click in your chart. So here I would like to change the colour of the red bars and the red bars only. So I click once on one of the red bars so they all get selected, as you can see here. Then where the paint tin icon is, I get a fill and also a border option just by clicking on these arrows. I would like a different fill and I would like a different colour. So under fill colour, I will select something different, let's say purple. Then it updates the chart. If you're printing in black and white, you can also ask for a pattern fill, which is quite handy as well. You can have a different colour for the border than you do for the fill if you need to here, um, but generally most people don't use that. If you would like to change the values on the y-axis, so the range on this y-axis, because obviously nothing is lower than 1000, you might as well start at the 1000 mark. So I'm going to click on one of the values of the y-axis so that they all become selected. Then in the format axis window, click on the bar chart looking symbol. Okay. If you click on the arrow next to axis options, it allows you to change the minimum and the maximum values. So I want to change the minimum value to 1000. Then I'll hit enter and it updates the chart. If I want the increments to go by 250 increments rather than 500, you can do that in this units box. So I'll change that to 250. And then you get more anchor points. Um, there are a number of different things that you can do um, with formatting. You just basically have to click on whatever you want to format and then you will have all the options you need in these areas. Okay, so um, the next type of chart I wanted to show you was a chart similar to this but has two y axes and this is used a lot in economics where you want to look at trend patterns but the two um, variables that you're looking at have very different scales so to do that i will scroll down a bit further and find the secondary axis chart so um, to do this we're going to click and drag to select the number of enrollments in the different years and we have number of students and number of classes. So the number of students is a lot higher than the number of classes and they're not going to look great on a chart together. So we're going to use something called a combo chart to get two axes, two y axes. So if you now click on the insert menu at the top, click on recommended charts and you'll see it recommends a clustered column chart, but you can't really tell the, the trends there. So what we need to go, what we need to do is to click on the all charts tab and then select combo, which is right down the bottom. Now it still looks pretty similar at the moment, but you'll notice there's a box down the bottom that allows us to create a secondary axis. So I'm gonna create a secondary axis for classes by ticking this box for secondary axis classes. You can choose which one has which symbol. So you can change students to a line graph and classes to bar or leave it here as it is, clustered column for students and a line chart for classes. And this looks quite good. So if I now click OK, I have a chart with two Y axes. Unfortunately, you don't know which axis refers to which one of these. Okay, so we do need to label both of these Y axes. And if you remember from earlier, we can do that simply by clicking on the plus symbol next to the chart, axis titles, and we want the primary, ah, uh, sorry, the primary vertical and also the secondary vertical axes. And now I can go into the chart and I can say that this is for 
enrollments. And this axis is for classes. The next type of chart I wanted to show you was a chart, a line chart of means um, with error bars representing two standard errors, which is commonly used in the sciences. So we will now move on to the error bar tab, which is just down here. So the error bar spreadsheet. I'm going to create a line chart where the, the points on the line chart are going to be the means of the take home exams for each one of these courses. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward as we've seen before. I just click and drag to select my summary table. This is information that we will use for the error bars in the next step. Then click on insert. I'm going to go straight to a line chart from this drop down menu. I'll select the first one and then there you have it. Now I want to add the error bars so we can get some idea of the variability around each of these means. To do that, we can click on the plus symbol next to it and then error bars. So it puts some error bars there. If I click on the black arrow next to it, if I specify standard error, it doesn't look right. All of them look exactly the same width and they're very, very small. And that's because Excel doesn't actually know what the standard error of the mean is for your data. This is the only information you have given it. So these are just guesses. It's really important to remember that just by clicking on standard error does not give you standard error bars it gives you placeholders for proper standard error bars. What you need to do to get the actual standard errors is to click on more options. And when you do that, it changes this window to the right hand side so you can format the error bars. You go to the little um, bar chart symbol on the right to change what the error bars represent. So it's set to standard error, but as I said, it doesn't know what the standard errors are. So we need to put in custom values by clicking on the customs radio button. The information that I'm gonna give it, I had to calculate myself. So in the table, next to the table of means, I've calculated the standard deviation of each one of those means the number of people that represents, and then calculate, calculated two standard errors, okay? And here's the formula for calculating one standard error. So I've done this once and then just doubled it. So these represent two standard errors from the mean. And those are the values that I'm going to put in for these error bars. So I've ticked custom in the error amount, and now I'm going to click on the specify value box. You see here in the positive error value, so they're the bars above the mean, it's guessed that it's going to be one and it's wrong. So I'm going to delete Excel's guess. Then I'm going to use my mouse to click and drag to highlight the actual error amount that I want displayed. Do not include the header. It doesn't want to know that, it just wants to know the actual values. I have to do the same thing again for the negative error value box so that it does the equal distance below the mean as well. So I'll delete the negative error value that's in that box, go back to my table, click and drag to highlight those standard errors, then click OK. And now I have the proper standard error bars. Um, sometimes when you see these charts, if they all look identical, it's because somebody has forgotten to go that little extra step further. Okay, so now I'm going to close this format plot area so I have a bit more space and I will show you how to do pivot tables. So if you go back to the functions 
spreadsheet. Okay, we're going to use this to create a pivot table. Um, when we were doing the filtering function beforehand, um, you might have thought that you could filter this data out and find out what the mean was of the total amount just for these courses if you filtered the data just by those courses. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. It will still give you the average amount for the entire data set when you use the filter function. Okay, so that's why we have pivot tables. To create a pivot table, I'm going to select the data I want to include in the table again, uh, much the same way that we did for sorting. Then go to the insert menu at the top. Um, if you're very lucky, you can look in recommended pivot tables and you'll find exactly what you want. But in my experience, that never happens, unfortunately. So we'll click on pivot table to just insert a pivot table. Um, it will ask us to make sure that that's the selection we want, and it is. It's going to create a new worksheet for us. So we'll get a new tab down the bottom here. Click OK. And now we have um, the start of a pivot table. You'll notice that we have a new spreadsheet called Sheet 2. If you want to rename a spreadsheet, it's very, very easy. You just have to right click on the name that's there, click rename, and I will call this pivot table. Enter. You can also move these spreadsheets around, so change the order of them. So if I want the pivot table at the end, all I have to do is click on pivot table header, then drag, and let go after functions and move them around that way. Okay, so here we have our pivot table fields. These are all the columns that we can use in creating our tables. If I click somewhere outside of this pivot table image, those pivot table fields will go away. Don't panic, you just have to click on the image again and you have your fields again. The easiest way to construct a pivot table is to actually get a pen and paper and draw up the table that you want to see. It will make it a lot easier to decide which of these columns go into which of these boxes. Okay, so I would like to know the total number of people in each of the courses who passed and failed. So in courses, I want in the rows, I want the courses. So I can just tick the box that says course and it will guess that that's where I want it to go. If I didn't want it to go in the rows, but I wanted it to go in columns, I can just click on course and drag it to the columns box and let go. In fact, I always find that it's easier to just click and drag to the box you want in the first place rather than just ticking. Now in the columns, I want to know the number of people who passed and failed. So I'll click and drag pass and fail into the columns box. So this is the table that I want to see, but I have no information in it. So to find out how many people are in each of these categories, I need to put something in the values box where this sigma symbol is. Essentially, you can put any variable in there. I could put uni ID in there. It, all it does is count how many people. But the best thing to do is probably just to reuse one of these variables, pass, fail, or course, in your values box. So I'm going to take pass, fail again from the main menu, click and drag it into the values box, and let go. And now it tells me the count of people in each one of those cells. So four people failed in B-A-L-L-B -L -L -B and 22 passed. And the grand total of people in that course was 26. If I wanted to know the average grade of people who passed and failed within each of those courses, then I will need to use their total mark for the values in the table instead. So I'll take count of pass fail and drag that out of the values box. Then take total and drag that into the values box. If 
by default it's always going to count the sums right so if you wanted anything other than sums you need to change it either by clicking on the drop down menu in the value field settings area okay so you can change that here but a much easier way if i cancel out of here is just to go to the table itself right click on one of the cells in the table with the values and then you can change how the values are summarized so i'm going to summarize the values by average click average and now i just have the average mark for all the people who failed and all the people who passed if i just wanted the average mark for all of the courses regardless of whether or not they failed or passed i can change the table again by deleting the columns so i will now take pass and fail out of the columns area move it back and now i just have the average course mark for each one of those courses. You'll notice that a lot of them have very, very large decimal places. You can always change the number of decimal places on the Home tab by selecting the cells that you want to change. On the Home tab, click in the Number area on one of these two options. So the first zero option is to increase the decimal. The second one is to decrease. So if I click on this once, it puts all of the decimal places to the same place, but one less than the highest. If I keep clicking, I can keep clicking until I get two decimal places, which is what I'm more comfortable with. Again, you can always increase or decrease that way. Um, in pivot tables, if you had, um, if you wanted to filter out um, the past fail marks in this particular course, there is also a filter option. So if I click pass fail and drag that to the filters box, okay, at the moment it's showing everyone, but I can filter this data that it, so that it only shows the people who passed the course. So on the drop down menu, I will filter to only people who passed then OK, and you'll see the marks are higher. You can always change that back again by clicking on the filter for pass, selecting all, and then OK. One thing that you need to remember about pivot tables is that they are not like charts. So if you go back to the functions spreadsheet, which created the pivot table, and change any of these values in the data, the pivot table does not automatically update. So it's usually good practice, particularly when you're working with other people, to refresh the pivot table every time you work with it. You can do that by right clicking on the values in the pivot table and then clicking refresh. So they're the basics of pivot tables. And that's everything that I was hoping to show you today. Um, if you have any questions um, after this webinar, uh, please feel free to email the Digital Literacy Training Team and they will get in touch with me. Thank you very much for coming.